Okay, we're recording and I'm with Eric Hauser. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Eric, you, we're going to talk about one of your scenes in a second, but I want to talk about what you're doing first. You built a uh, new software. Tell me, yep. tell me about it. Well, I've been uh, working with you and listening to lots of podcasts and lots of um, reading books and everything. And uh, I developed a methodology to be able to write scenes and write books. So uh, I was using this out of Excel. And then I started building a platform to be able to share it with people. And uh, well, it, it's going to be available in a few days. Probably uh, it will be when the uh, podcast will be live. Yeah, but I'm having, this goes uh, out. It'll yeah. have been up for a couple months. Yeah, so yeah, yeah it's going to be live. So it's called uh, bookplotter.com. And I'm using uh, all of your tools to be able to, uh, to define a, the character voice, the emotions and everything. And I'm using also uh, some tools I developed myself. Uh, I call it um, Writer on Fire. So when you're writing a scene, it starts with the, uh, the spark. So what's initiating the scene? And then you create heat. Nice. Under your uh, protagonist, protagonist's uh, feet. And after that, you have some overheat. So you need to take a decision. You know, when the, uh, the needle heats, hits overheat in your car, you have to take a decision. So that's the same thing. And after that, you have the wrap up. Awesome. So if, so if you look at uh, what it spells out, you know, S-H-O-W, okay? It spells out show. So if you want to put out a good show, you, you could use this, so. That's clever, man. Nice. Yeah, so I you sent me the screen grabs of yeah. the scene. Been working, working on, on it for many months now. Yeah. And uh, Congratulations on finishing. I think that's oh, awesome. Oh, thanks a lot. No, yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It always feels good to like finish something like that. And I know you've been working on it hard. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you're putting it out in the world. That's exciting. Um, yeah. So how's this book? You and I have done a couple chapters in this book already on the, on the podcast. So yeah. give us an update. How's the book coming? Books come along fine. Uh, you know, I'm spreading my time between writing the book and building the software. Nice. Well, the building part's kind of done. So, so that's plus nice. being a father of four and a full-time job. So <laughs> Yeah, seriously. So it's getting along fine. I'm halfway into the book. I'm halfway. So uh, this is like the uh, the mirror when you hit the uh, middle scene. Yeah. So my hero in this here has been running away. You know, you have your uh, your response, which is uh, fight or flight. Mm -hmm. So he's been trained all his life by his mother, flight. So he has to hide all the time, and now he's at a point where or hiding doesn't work anymore. Okay. You know, uh, his friend has been kidnapped and um, uh, she's going to be killed if he doesn't uh, meet his nemesis. So uh, he decides he's, he's trying to find some help. Nobody is able to help him right now. So he has to go on his own. And uh, he has this interior fear that when he fights or when he's in a stressful situation, he feels that he has this beast inside him that just want to, wants to come out. And that really scares him. And now he doesn't have the choice. He has to release the beast. Gotcha. Nice. Um, is this the first time he's released the beast? It happened uh, while well, releasing it. No. Uh, the beast was there a once before. He couldn't control it. Okay. And he smashed his hand in a wall. No breaking the uh, the cement okay so he knows something is there he just doesn't understand and it yet okay so this is kind of the first time that he's um uh experimenting with it on purpose yeah exactly okay so there's a couple things um there's things i love about this so you wrote an action scene we get David as your lead character and Robert, Robert McNeil as your, like, uh, the, um, uh, what did you call it? Um, his nemesis. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So 
you know, they're they're kind of stalking each other. It's very kind of old westernish, where it's like high noon, and they're both kind of standing out there looking at each other. And then the fighting starts, and I love how you have them talking through the action scene. It's really great. You did a good job um, balancing David's exterior voice, David's interior voice, and Robert's voice. It's you've done really great with it. Uh, and the scene is really moving, like it moves really strong. And then there's a surprise woman that jumps in at the end with a kind of a sniper rifle and starts shooting people. And then we transition to a second scene in the sewers where David finds his missing love. Are they are they boyfriend, girlfriend or is it just no, his friend? just friend? His okay. friend. He, he would want more, but uh, she doesn't want to. Gotcha. Okay, so he finds Claire in the base in the sewers, and they kind of uh, track through. Not Claire, Roxanne. Roxanne. He finds Roxanne through the sewers. They kind of track through the sewers, and um, finally come to a door, and the, it kind of ends at the door. So it's nice. It's a two pronged yeah. scene. Um, you're moving the action really well with dialogue, which we can look at more in a minute. You've got. You did a great job of like find of keeping conversational pieces or segments together and dropping description in between the segments you did a really great job with that i was really impressed well um, i learned from the best <laughs> well <laughs> good job man it's it reads really well um so most of my notes are pretty nitpicky so as we go, <laughs> as we go through the notes i'm gonna nitpick a little bit because you did you did such a good job laying it out um yeah, anything specifically you want to talk about before I just start like rolling through the document? Uh, well, we'll get at the end. There's something I wanted to put in, but with the comments you gave me, uh, I decided to pull it out. Okay. You know, at, at one point, since he's releasing the beast, yeah, I, I want him to, his thoughts are like different. And yeah. he has like a different personality. Okay. A bit. So uh, at one point in there, uh, his thoughts about Roxanne were not as pure as the ones he had before. Gotcha. And after reading it, you know, I wanted to him because he's a gentleman and all along as we see him, he's a good guy. Yeah. And at one point here, you know, he starts starting to look at her differently. But after reading your comments and going back through it, you know, I, I didn't like the scene. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how we can. So let me find where you're talking about and let's read it because now that i hear that i was i was thinking you were doing something else so okay. um so it's right here it's uh bottom of six um they're kind of wandering around the sewer together and she says uh sorry i'm looking for a good place to start says um you got a problem with that goliath that's what she's saying to him he says not at all captain he said with the corners of his lips slightly twitching upwards, it's this way, she said, passing uh, in front of him, swinging the bar over her shoulder in a two-handed grip. She's got guts, he thought, watching her take the lead, and those yoga pants really look good on her. Could you please focus the light a little bit higher, she asked, because he's like shining it on her. Uh, yes, of course. Get your mind straight, David. He thought, we have to get out of here. So the way it stands right now, it's not enough for the hypersexualization of like the beast being released and making him uncomfortable. It's just enough to make him creepy. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think if you want to keep it, if you want to keep the like hypersexualization, you kind of start it at first when he like, you know, they they fall, she he comes into the sewer and she attacks him with this metal bar. I really loved this section, by the way. And he smells her right away. And I wouldn't, if you want to keep it, that needs to be the start of his hypersexualization. And it needs to make him uncomfortable. And then he needs to be kind of eyeing her as a piece of meat all the way through five and six. And every time he does it, he needs to have that inner dialogue of stop it. This isn't you. Stop it. This is bad. I don't like, I don't like looking at like, I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm thinking this, but 
for the for the reader to get it it needs to be like 10 times bigger than it is and he needs to have a, have a much bigger inner debate about it than he's having does that make sense okay okay yeah i i mean i now that i hear what you're going for i can totally see how you were going there but like here when i woke up my hands and feet were bound with duct tape uh she said it with a slight tremor of her voice i also had one over her mouth david hugged her it's gonna be okay we're getting out of here when he hugs her if he's hypersexualized, like this has to send his head through the roof right like he doesn't want to let go he wants to keep holding yep. on to her like you know and he has to like force himself to let go so as he hugs her and says it's going to be okay we're going to get out of here he needs to hold on too long he needs to be like oh she feels great up against me and she needs to kind of push away and he needs to, and he needs to hold on and she needs to be like let me go and he's like sorry i'm so sorry i'm so sorry right like but we need that kind of inner turmoil turmoil all throughout if you're going to go for that like hypersexualization does that make sense yeah I, i'm not sure anymore if i want to go in that direction yeah i understand it's 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 yeah. tricky it's tricky yeah because i don't want him to be like a creep yeah you know you could turn him into a sexual assaulter real quick yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so i i'm no i read it over you know and i said no i i don't want to go there yeah you know, i i want to show the difference between when he's um when he's ready to fight and the beast is released. Yeah. And I thought that would have been a good option also, but uh, I don't like it. Yeah, it does. It does make him, it takes him from being like, you know, the, the semi lovable Hulk to like, I don't know. And this kind of like dangerous, I'm not comfortable around him. Exactly. Know. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want that. If this were an erotica, yeah, one hundred percent would. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Release that's not what the I'm beast. writing. Yeah, <laughs> but that's, this isn't that. But so if that's what you're doing, one hundred percent release that beast in the sewer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I I think it's but, wise. Not but, to head by the way, it's not a sewer. Oh, it's not. I thought he goes no. down a manhole cover. He he goes down a manhole cover, but that's over an old prison in Montreal. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, downtown Montreal, there's a prison that's been closed for over 200 years. No way. And the basement of that, uh, of that area, yeah, there, there's a park now over at a square. It's called the uh, Vauclin Square. Wow. And uh, the remnants of that prison is still there. So I had to find a good place for him to hide her. And yeah. I decided I, I went through different things and that place is supposedly haunted and nobody's allowed to go there. It's right beside City Hall. Nice. So I'm, I'm trying to find different areas, you know, where he's able to go and things that bring out uh, history. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, did it's an I interesting miss, place. Did I miss the description of that? Is the description of that in here? Uh, it's in the previous chapter okay but a few places in there i mentioned that it's a uh the old prison gotcha and i mentioned that it's a uh like a torture chamber or something i i thought you were speaking metaphorically no <laughs> but i didn't no, read it, the it, previous it, it chapter is. so no, yeah no, exactly yeah 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 because that's history like that's such great i love it when a book gives me real local history that's my favorite so like that's one of my like I love that's one of the reasons I like modern urban fantasy or historical fiction as well like when you give me a real setting and like drop all the details like you just described to me like I'm like oh that's cool and I'll actually like when I'm done reading the chapter I'll like jump onto Google and see if I can find pictures and like you know I, I get I get into it so yeah, you know yeah. I think the more of that you can include the better i think that's great yeah i'm doing a lot of that that's awesome um okay what about the ring you say here his ring warned him that his nemesis is there is the ring explained earlier too yes the okay. ring is explained in chapter uh four and in many different chapters it's a magical ring 
Yeah. And his father had it. Then when he died, his mother had it. And now he has it. So the, the ring warns him when a bone seeker is near. Gotcha. It okay. heats up. So the nice. first time he wears it, he, uh, he doesn't understand what's going on. Yeah. You know, his hand is burning. Yeah, and yeah, he yeah. doesn't understand why. So now he knows. Nice. Okay. I love it. I think it's, uh, I think it's a great tool. Um, and you don't need to explain it more than what you did if you've already explained it, but I always yeah. have to, I always have to double check and you know, yeah. you know, me jumping into jumping into a scene in the middle of a book. I'm like, do, do we know what the ring is? Yeah. I don't want to assume. Yeah. Okay. So I loved this section here and I want to talk about it because I want you to slow it down. So um, we've got Robert McNeil yells in a loud voice. David, is that you? Robert McNeil said a loud voice turning toward him. David ducked behind the wall. Don't be shy. I've installed eight wireless night vision cameras with motion detectors all over the square to see you coming. It's amazing what you can find in department stores now. Under $30. Can you believe it? Not that money matters. He said in a cocky voice. His voice is great, right? Like, I love his, like, he's got the, like, villain ramble going on. Like, it's very Batman villainy. It's really great. Um, shit there goes the element of surprise David thought if you can just get close enough I could rip his arm off and beat his brains out with it his own thoughts startled him what in God's name am I thinking I'm here to rescue Roxanne not to kill him so this is great inner thought it's getting that like beast conflict that you want yep. going on Yeah. your next line is David come out come out wherever you are we actually need David's physical response here but like, and it doesn't need to be a lot. It just needs to be like he pressed himself closer to the wall or like, you know, his heart started to race. But you've got three characters in this conversation. You've got his inner thoughts. You've got his exterior motive, his exterior vocalizations and moves. And then you've got um, McNeil, right? So just like you'd write a three-person scene, we got to get his exterior moves in here or we're not going to be able to visualize what he's doing. So interior thought, and then we need like what happens. And then McNeil yells, David, come out wherever you are. And then you had this, oh, you're there. McNeil said, laughing hysterically. I want you to slow it down. And I want a little bit more before he finds him. Because it's such a great one. It's like that classic villain scene where the, the good guy's hiding. He's debating whether or not he should come out. Right, like he's he, he's it's the hero moment where he's finally gonna like rally his courage. Give us a little bit more before he finds him, right? Like okay. a little more threats, a little more tormenting. And, and then you have that, oh, here you are, McNeil said, laughing hysterically. David around the corner and showed himself. I want because this is the first time that he's like open to like testing out the beast. It's the first time he's going to stand up. We need a, a much bigger debate here about whether or not he comes out. Right. Cause you're, you're expressing that like fight or flight desire. Like we got to have, it. we got to have that yeah. like big, big internal um, conundrum. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Yeah. In your next book, David just comes out from around the corner, right? Yeah. Like, cause then he's the fully developed, but here we got to see that like pushback. Yeah. Um, I also want more here in that like debate. So, uh, McNeil says, well, oh, young, young man, I see you're alone and a mocking childish voice pretending to wipe the fake tears. He added your little puppy didn't, your little puppy didn't make it. Uh, I'll yeah, give you because in the previous chapter. He shot his dog. Oh, he is. The... Um, so that hurts. So David says, I'll give you tears. David thought, imagining his thumbs gouging out the man's eyes. Come closer, boy. I won't hurt you. This is another one of those. If you're like releasing the beast and this is like not normal to him, I want more. Like I want an, I want the image of this imagination, right? Like digging his thumbs into his eyes, the lens popping under the pressure. McNeil screams echoing through through the park, right? Like I, I want the full image here so that i can live in that like the beast is coming because what you like what i think you're going for and correct me if you're wrong is that you kind of want the reader reveling a little bit in the beast yeah exactly yeah it's like when the hulk shows up in a hulk movie exactly you're, you're excited like you know he's gonna wreck stuff but you're kind of excited about it and it's the same thing you're looking yeah. for here so like let us you know 
hang out with the beast on and off here. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so here, which is funny, because I told you I want more in this sentence, but now I'm going to tell you I want less here. <laughs> So here he starts thinking of all the ways. David walked towards him, looking at his surroundings for potential escape routes and weapons, right? Awesome. I get McNeil. I get the physical. And now I'm going to get David's internal thoughts. Trees, branches, ripe, ripe uh, rip one off and slay him like a vampire. Worked for Buffy. Pebble trees around, good distraction in the face. Could clog up a windpipe, flagpole, break it off, joust him like a medieval knight. He'd make a great shish kebab, soft drink bottle on the bench, jam it down his throat. And I see how well he laughs after that. Bench is bolted down, can't rip them out fast enough, but sticking his torso under and bending him in half like a scorpion would break his spine. Stone concrete everywhere, rip him around like a rag doll and call him puny. So you didn't have enough here. You've got too much here. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. like I want three of these. I don't I you've got okay. I think I think I counted six and I only need three. Or if you want to keep them all, break them in half. Give me three, let McNeil yell something, and then let David continue to think about it. Does that make sense? Okay, it does make sense. I but, already reworked that. So oh uh, nice. What'd you do with it? I removed the tree branch, kept the pebbles because we see it later on. Okay. Uh, kept the uh, medieval knight there. Nice. Uh, and kept the, uh, the bench. Oh, good. Those were my three favorite too. The yeah. soft, the software bottle down his throat was a little like, I don't know if you're actually going to make that happen. You'd have to hold his mouth open. It's so weird. But I like the three you picked. That's great. Yeah. Um. So you're doing this thing a lot where you interrupt dialogue with a tag in the middle. Sometimes it works really, really well. True, he said dismissively. You are a key. When I touched you, it unlocked memories and knowledge of 100 bone seekers before me. This is a great place for a middle dialogue tag because there's a natural break between true and you are a key. Yeah. Right? This is not a great place. Don't you find it ironic you're named David and your girlfriend calls you Goliath? He laughed. It's hysterical. I don't need to, he laughed, right? Like, don't okay. you find it ironic you're called David and your girlfriend calls you Goliath? It's hysterical, right? Like, because there's not a natural break between the two of those. So I would say be paying attention to where you're dropping that center dialogue tag and make sure you're putting it in places that don't interrupt the flow of the combo. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because your, your conversation's so good and the, like, way you're mixing in dialogue and action is so great i want to make sure we're not interrupting the energy that's building in people talking in the in the characters like interacting with each other um here's another place where i really wanted an external response from dave uh mcneil took a deep breath and then smiled you forgot kidnapper and potentially rapist she's quite lovely i will enjoy her he said, looking at the manhole cover at his feet. That's McNeil talking. Yeah. I want to make sure David's not saying that he's going to rape someone. No. So, <laughs> so that's the way in, David thought. I have to lead him away from the circle. McNeil pulled out his sword from his belt in a swift move. So I want, I want an external move here from Dave because they're in this like Western standoff face-to-face -face where they're about to have action. You know, even if it's just like a shifting of his weight or like, you know, wiping perspiration off of his brow, something that gives us where he is, because we get McNeil pulling out here and then <clears throat> uh, when David saw the weapon, he froze. Um, it was the same type of blade his mother was murdered with. So this is another place where I wanted more detail. How does he know the weapon is what his mother was murdered with? Okay, he, I think we're froze, no? No, I'm I here, okay. I can hear you, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I, I send you a video of that. It's a- Oh, is it that the weapon where he pulls yeah, it out of the, the belt? Yeah, the weapon. Okay, yeah, so- they, pu they pulled out of the belt. Yes. So it's so a let me special- just, Let me describe to the reader real quick what you sent me. Yeah. It is a sword that is hidden beneath your belt buckle and you, you whip it out from 
it almost looks like you're taking your belt off you're not you're pulling a sword out from under your belt yeah it was really cool yeah yeah, yeah. so i was looking for a special type of weapon that the bone seekers would have Okay. And when I found that one, I said, yeah, I really like that one. So he saw another bone seeker kill his mother with a sword like that. Okay. So he so saw it happen. A, yeah, he saw it. He was there. Gotcha. Okay. And I added a section in there this afternoon uh, after reading it uh, where he has the flashback because he keeps having nightmares every night of seeing gotcha. his mother's murder. Okay. So uh, I added that in there. Okay. So that that's in so you flash back to it now. I think yeah. I didn't realize his mother had seen it. Again, this is the problem with me editing a chapter and not reading before, especially when I'm gonna get all nitpicky. Yeah. Um but yeah, I think that's great. I love I love it. I think that's a good, a really good connection. Um I'm gonna read this next section because I thought it was a really great section and you did a good job with it. It says, uh, get your head in the game, he said to himself. This isn't the time. McNeil dragged the tip of his sword against the side of the fountain, making sparks as he closed in on his prey. It's a great sentence, man. David took a few steps back as his opponent quickened his pace. I got to move fast, he thought, looking at a small tree near him. McNeil charged, raised his weapon over his head, and swung it down toward his victim's neck. Now, David thought, as he ducked and dodged behind a small tree. I love how you're working the like inner thoughts and the exterior motion. It's really great. The sword cut halfway through the trunk. David crouched down, grabbed a small rock, grabbed small rocks at the foot of the tree and threw them at McNeil's face as he tucked and rolled. A uh, nice callback to the pebbles before. His arm was off and, he, and caught him mostly in the chest. A few of them hit his cheeks and tore the skin. Uh, and then you had, uh, that will match the one on your forehead, David said, running towards the fountain. I, I, I think it's, I loved that whole section i thought you did a really great job i like how you're balancing the action i like how it feels like a dance like mcneil and then david mcneil and then david like you're keeping that conversational flow of the action scene is really strong um and you're you're working david's interior thoughts in there to give us like the emotional content which is really good nice job with that man it was really nice thanks um i do want to know how we don't get how McNeil responds to pebbles being thrown in his face. I do want yeah. to know that. So we yeah. do, we do need to put that in there. Um, but besides I'll send that, you the rewrite. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> besides that, did you already fix that? Yeah, I did. Nice. I yeah. reworked the whole scene during my lunch. Did you? Oh, but it's a good scene. I don't know that it needs a full rework. It looks good. <laughs> um, yeah. So I thought that was great. Did you put this, so you have this, David looks at the water jets spouting water. Most of them were flush mount, but the ones in the middle seem to be treating a good six inches. Did you put this earlier or did you keep it here? Yeah, I put that earlier with the uh, the rest of the... Uh, nice. When you introduce it yeah. up here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, yeah, so you, you end up uh, dropping McNeil on, um, on the spike that's protruding. So putting it up, foreshadowing to it up here is is awesome. Uh, I think that's really great. And I, you know, it is that kind of like, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the author who is like, if there's a gun in the first in the first chapter, somebody be able to be dead with check a gunshot. Off. Check off, yeah. It is a little check off. If, there's, yeah. if someone's getting impaled in a spike, you better show me the spike at the beginning of the chapter. Um, no magic spikes. I mean, unless magic spikes are a thing, then you can have magic spikes, but you know what I mean. Uh, I added this sentence here just yep. to increase the urgency. So his sword gets stuck in this tree and David is like thinking about what he's going to do. Um, and then we get David charging him. So I just want to put this in here to increase the like pain and speed of what's happening. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So, but I think this whole scene is good. How did it feel to write this action scene like this? I liked it. You know, when I started writing about 10 years ago, I would describe a fight with all of the punches and the kicks and everything. You know, I've been doing martial arts all my, all my life. Yeah. So I would describe it with, you know, jab, jab, hook. And, and for a reader, you know, that's not, that's not good. You know, I really like uh, the Kenny Reeves movies, you know, but yeah. I wouldn't want to read it. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and it's hard. Like you can see it, and if you see it in a movie, it immediately registers what's happening. But if you don't know the terminology and you can't visualize it, it's really hard. So this is a really great visualization of an action scene. Yeah. You're giving me the step by step. You're telling me he moves here, he moves here, he moves here, he moves here. So you're getting that like jab, jab, hook, but it's not technical. It's very exactly. much like, yeah, I know what it looks like when somebody swings a sword really hard and gets it caught in a tree. Like, I know what that looks like. Yeah, but yeah so it's that, um, it, you did a really great job. I was, I was impressed. Thanks. Uh, nice work. Um, this is another moment where we get very David focused and we need to know what McNeil's doing. So David jumped to his feet uh, and walked slowly with the intent towards uh towards the groaning uh, McNeil. Let's finish this, David thought. He grabbed him by one foot and dragged him towards the fountain. Are you a good swimmer, Robert? David asked. They say someone can drag, can drown in two inches of water. Do you think that's true? David was about to step on the fountain edge when he heard a shot. So I need to know what McNeil's doing here when he's being dragged. Is he just unconscious? Is he just like being grabbed unconscious or is he thrashing or like, you know, is he groaning? Like what's happening? Just give me a little image of, of what he's doing. Yeah. Did yeah. you already fix this one? Yeah, I fixed it all. What'd you do with it? <laughs> uh, he's thrashing around trying nice. to, to, to figure out what's going on. Yeah. When he hit the floor, you know, he hit his heart, his head pretty hard. Yeah, yeah, you made that clear that he yeah. that he hits with a loud thump. Yeah. yeah, I like the thrashing because it also leads to the whole like, you know, David is the Hulk type image of him yeah. being able just to drag a thrashing man with one hand through this fountain. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice picture. Um, yeah. So down here, so David gets shot by accident, um, and I didn't know that he was shot until i got to the next page and he says i had a gun with yeah. uh did you what did you do to build this out here okay what i did is i uh i mentioned that uh when he feels the pain he looks at his uh, at his thigh yeah and notices that uh blood is uh staining his gene perfect i love it yeah that's awesome i love it and we just need you know i think it's so hard i was actually I was talking to one of my beta readers today for the novel that I've coming out and I have a guy, he walks into a homeless shelter and I talk about how there's a bouncer at the homeless shelter and the bouncer's like stopping the guy, letting him go through. And then the guy has a conversation with, with this man, sexy Tony. In my mind, it's very clear to me that the bouncer and sexy Tony are the same person. <laughs> and my beta reader, she's reading through the book. Okay. And she's texting me as she reads through it. So, which I love. I mean, real life responses from a, from a reader to a book, amazing feedback. So she's texting me as she reads through it. And she's like, okay, what happened to the bouncer at the door of the homeless shelter? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, what do you mean what happened? They have this big conversation. But I went back and read it. And sure enough, she's right. Like, I don't make a clear enough visual connection between... The, there's this that he is the guy talking is the bouncer and uh, i think a lot of times we do that as authors we like we have it so clear in our head that it like makes perfect sense when we write it and then somebody else reads it exactly. they're like what is that yeah so yeah. i think um yeah i'm glad you expanded that because i think again it's a pivotal moment you know the gunshot comes he's he's gonna limp from this gunshot later so i think it's a good it's a really good scene um you did you change anything else about the fight scene we haven't talked about uh i don't think so okay i love i i again man it was really nice it's it's a really smooth a uh, thing here you find the end of the segment really well so um claire is the one that shot him he says hearing david start claire looked up and saw the, the 300 pound steel frisbee coming at her with great speed her face could contorted as she dropped to the ground avoiding the inbound missile only by inches the cover smashed in the side of the city hall and it embedded itself uh to its core sending shards of stone and debris flying everywhere missed he said to himself i should have gotten uh one in vibranium funny call back tomorrow i like it he jumped down the hole uh hitting the ground hard uh four meters below his shot up leg not able to support the impact are gotta get up 
Rock, this is actually when I noticed that his leg was shot up, by the way. Gotta okay. get off. Roxanne's here somewhere. He took out his phone and turned on his flashlight. The old prison was a scary place, presumed to be haunted and forbidden to enter. I see it now that you've described it to me. Yeah. I thought he was being like the old prison was like a metaphor for where his Roxanne was being kept. But I get it now. Uh, David can see yeah. why the masonry hole. So you go on to describe the, the prison here. And it's it's a really great description. And then his mind is going to start to race about Roxanne. So what I love is that you're in this natural transition. You're changing scenery. You're changing setting. So you're going to give us a second here to describe the setting and get us into it before he starts looking for Roxanne. It's, it's really great. Like, this is the perfect, like, mid-segment transition to the next scene. You did really well, man. It was a nice, uh, it was a nice jump. Um. And I'm I'm super curious. Have you been down in that prison? No. Oh. I would like to go though. Yeah. I saw they... a few pictures, and uh, I need to go. I need to yeah. go and see that. But it's it's not a uh, place you're supposed to be able to go. And that manhole cover gave access, and actually, it's been sealed up now. No way. That's yeah. hysterical. Yeah. 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 I I I have some. I have a weird. I've never done it, but I have a weird fascination with that, like urban spelunking where they're like going to like abandoned places or abandoned yeah. towns in the U S it's always abandoned malls. Cause we have all these malls everywhere. That's like, you know, this used to be a big thing outside of town. All the stores have moved into strip malls now. Like they've all, they've all moved into outward facing malls instead of inward facing malls. Yeah. And so the inward facing malls are like abandoned and empty. Uh, we've got like, I think three of them here in Baltimore or four of them here in Baltimore. And people are constantly walking through them, like just taking pictures of them and like, you know, these weird haunted freaky places that nature's slowly reclaiming or Baltimore has a ton of factories that like yep. used to be factories, but because we're like, you know, the city has been in decline since the seventies, really. Like we have all these huge abandoned factories everywhere. People always, I haven't gotten up the courage to go in one yet. But I like I like looking at other people's pictures of them. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Great locations for stuff, yeah. uh, especially for books. I had a I used an abandoned factory as a uh, villain's hideout in one of my detective novels. They were stealing art and hiding it in this abandoned factory. It was, it was a fun. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, cool. Yeah. You've got some pacing things going on here. So, like, I want where are we what are we doing here she jumped as his hands made contact i want these two on the same line does that make sense because they're both yeah, it does. Yep. and and part of that's just you know cleaning up paragraphs uh here's another one it says like it, it's nothing he lied omitting um, omitting to mention that he had a bullet lodged in his thigh and then you had paragraphed down he picked up the phone and illuminated her needing to see that she was all right wow he whispered as he exhaled which is part of that like you know, hypersexualized beast coming out. Um, yep. But putting that all, because that's all his action, putting that all on the same paragraph line uh, as just kind of a block for him, I think works yep. better, especially in this like two person conversation. Um, I think it works really well. So when you took out his beast, his hypersexualized beast, how do you feel it plays now? Uh, it plays well because okay. I, I I removed some of that, left some things in there also. So uh, when he notices her dress that way, he still has the wow. Yeah. But after that, you know, after his stare, uh, he feels like bad that he didn't notice that her uh, her wrists were wounded from the uh, the duct tape. Oh, that's nice. That's more compassionate. Yeah, exactly. Than looking at her younger fans that's yeah. nice yeah and that makes it more relatable to the reader because noticing her wrists are wounded is caring and compassionate noticing yeah. she's got a nice butt in a haunted prison is uh creepy and weird creepy. Um, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's really cool uh, i'm like i'm glad you made that transition um yeah. Yeah, this is more of that. We've already talked about that. I don't need to yeah. talk about that. Um, I wanted a little bit more here. Um, so he kicks the door. And he has this like searing pain 
that kind of like knocks him out a little bit. Um, yeah. He kicked the door of the front kick as he saw, uh, as he saw done in so many action movies before. Totally something I would do because I've seen it in a movie. Uh, the door flew open with a loud crack and the pain is like shot directly to his brain as he crumbled to the ground. David, he, um, David, she was walking toward him. As her words were swirling, only swirling colors in his mind. That's a great line. She was walking to him, but her words were only swirling colors in his mind. Really nice. When the fog finally lifted, she tried to help. So the problem is he doesn't really hear her until the fog starts to lift, but you've got her screaming David here. So I would just make a note about the screen, how he's perceiving that scream. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, because otherwise it felt like, does he hear her? Does he not hear her? Like what's going on? But I love that he passes out. It's a really good, um, yeah. And then here, he kind of moves on too quickly from being passed out. He looked down at his leg. Roxanne finished making... Uh, the Garrett using his belt to stop the hemorrhage. I totally butchered that word. Are you able to sit? She asked, helping him up. Yes. What happened to your leg? It's nothing. It doesn't look like nothing. Help me get up. We need to leave. So I need a little bit, like we need to bring him out of the wooziness slower. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you edit this already? Of course. What'd you do with it? <laughs> uh, when he talks, he slurs a little bit. Okay. I like that. And he's dizzy. He's not able to get up uh, easily. She has to help him. Nice. That's perfect. And it's that, you know, again, it's that thing of like, I think I visualize when I'm writing, I visualize it in my head. It makes perfect sense to me. But like, I think sometimes it's just harder to transition it to the page. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah man. So this was great. Those were all the notes I had. I feel like you rocked it. Anything else great. with the piece you want to talk about? Uh, no, there was one part where you said when uh, Claire shoots him, that he or she should shoot a second time. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, my my Microsoft Word just died, which is weird. So let me okay. open it back up. Um, okay. Sometimes Word does that to me. It's just like I'm tired. I'm done. Uh, yeah. So you've got this scene where Claire shoots him, and Claire is moving to uh, McNeil. Yeah. And David realizes that she's moving to McNeil. Um, so it's right here. Uh, and the, the thing is the stakes start to drop as he transitions into the sewer. So I want a little bit more like, oh, this is still urgent. So, um, he scanned the square and saw Claire Kowalski standing at the, at the South end of the square with a gun raised bitch. He shouted, he stayed low, giving her the smallest target possible. His blood was tinting the water. I got to find somewhere to hide. He saw the um, Veliquin monument and dashed toward it, expecting to hear gunshots as he exited the fountain, but there were none. She probably was too preoccupied with McNeil's condition. So made it, he thought, as he slid behind the statue. Made it and him sliding behind the statue has no, there's no urgency here because she's yeah. not, she doesn't care about him. And he realizes as he's running that she doesn't care about him. So why not just like, trot over does that make sense yeah the reason why she doesn't shoot a second time it's because this is a red herring she's uh she's not after him yeah she's yeah. after mcneil now okay she was after him because she thought he was the murderer and a few scenes before or uh, yeah. six or seven scenes before uh, they have an altercation and david actually breaks her hand so now she's shooting with her left hand she was trying to shoot McNeil because he was grabbing the sword, but she got David instead. Nice. Does that come out later? Do they actually talk yeah, about it? Yeah, it's going to come out later. Okay. Yeah. So what I would recommend is that he, she actually yells something back at him because he yells, bitch. Yeah. Give her a response. And I, it can just be like a one word thing, but he can yell, bitch. He can stay low, giving her as his blood tending the water. Let her scream something back at him. Like, you know, you better run, asshole. And then, like, but that satisfies my, like, need to figure out what she's doing. Yeah. And why she's there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And it, it doesn't raise the stakes, but it at least engages her more in the scene. If that, uh, if that connects. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's still, it's a great scene. And I'm 
I'm sorry I'm nitpicking, but this is what happens when you send me something good. I just like <laughs> this is gonna pick at it. Um no, but this was really really important to me because it's like the first scene that I write that's a fight scene with dialogue in it. You know, so I wanted to have your uh, your comments on it to see if it was good or not. Yeah, it is. It, you did a great yeah. job with it. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me read it on on uh, on the podcast. It's it's yeah. great. Thanks yeah. a lot for your help. I really appreciate it. Of course. I'm gonna stop the recording when you talk some more. <laughs>